<laughs> yes, here we are. Um, in this book, we find Jimmy in the tree at the beginning, and then we go back in time to find out how he got into this plight, and then we go forward in time to find out what he's going to do next. In other words, the structure of the book is like that of the Iliad. <laughs> which it resembles in no other way. <laughs> but that is the structure. So in this part, we've gone back into the, the past of, of Snowman Jimmy, and he's about 10. And he is, uh, because he's, he goes to a school where they teach a lot of tech stuff, he has figured out how to bug his own house. And he's got microphones planted both in the kitchen and uh, in the living room, and he's listening in on his parents. All children of that age snoop on their parents. Uh, I'm here to warn you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just what's in the bookshelf, it's what's in the drawers. They will go through your drawers. It's just childish curiosity. And Jimmy's father and Jimmy's mother are not getting on. Uh, Jimmy's father works in an enclave because in the immediate future, we're not just going to have gated communities, we're going to have gated entire businesses. And people are going to live inside them. They're going to have lots of security because we don't want any scientists um, kidnapped for their brains. I was also warped in youth by reading a book called Donovan's Brain. Did you ever come across that one? Donovan cr cr crashes in a plane, but they rescue his brain, <laughs> which they keep in a jar. <laughs> and they think if they feed it a lot of brain food, it will get very, very big and wise, and it will solve the problems of the ages. But instead, it just gets very big and continues to be the very same brain that it was before. And Donovan was a sort of crook and um, wheeler dealer. And the problem with this brain is that it becomes so powerful that it can electrocute you. Um, <laughs> and it can read your mind. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> I love the solution in that book. It was a selfless scientist, because there are selfless scientists in, in novels. And he decides he, yeah. <laughs> he decides he has to get rid of it. And how he does it is he memorizes French poetry. And this confuses the brain completely. <laughs> so by reciting the French poetry in his head while he approaches the brain to pull out its plug, um, he keeps it from knowing what he's about to do. And this is a very utilitarian thing about French poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very handy to know that. <laughs> anyway, that's a diversion. Um, they're not getting on. Jimmy's father is involved in um, um, experimenting with pigs, which is currently being done. And in fact, everything in this book has its little research cl clipping in the ominously named uh, big brown box in the cellar. And. Um, they are working on the pigs. They, they haven't solved it yet, but they would like to have the pigs grow kidneys that they could transplant into you and me. This is your stuff. Mm. <laughs> I don't work with pigs. <laughs> you work with kidneys, though. <laughs> yes. It could be useful. I mean, pig kidneys are much yeah, bigger, bigger than yeah. I rat, about it. rat kidneys. <laughs> yeah. What's that for, said the voice of Jimmy's mother. She meant the champagne. We've done it, said Jimmy's father's voice. I think a little celebration is in order. A scuffle. Maybe he'd tried to kiss her. Done what? Pop of the champagne cork. Come on, it won't bite you. A pause. He must be pouring it out. Yes, the clink of glasses. Here's to us. Done what? I need to know what I'm drinking to. Another pause. Jimmy pictured his father swallowing his Adam's apple going up and down, bobbity bobble. It's the neuroregeneration project. We now have genuine human neocortex tissue growing in a pigoon. Finally, after all those duds, 
Think of the possibilities for stroke victims and that's all we need, said Jimmy's mother. More people with the brains of pigs. <laughs> Don't we have enough of those already? <laughs> Can't you be positive just for once? All this negative stuff, this is no good, that's no good, nothing's ever good enough according to you. Positive about what? That you've thought up yet another way to rip off a bunch of desperate people, said Jimmy's mother in that new, slow, anger-free voice. God, you're cynical. No, you are. You and your smart partners, your colleagues. It's wrong. The whole organization is wrong. It's a moral cesspool, and you know it. We can give people hope. Hope isn't ripping off. At new skins prices it is. You hype your wares and take all their money and then they run out of cash and it's no more treatments for them. They can rot as far as you and your pals are concerned. Don't you remember the way we used to talk, everything we wanted to do, making life better for people, not just people with money? You used to be so... You had ideals then. Sure, said Jimmy's father in a tired voice. I've still got them. I just can't afford them. A pause. Jimmy's mother must have been mulling that over. Be that as it may, she said, a sign that she wasn't going to give in. Be that as it may, there's research and there's research. What you're doing, this pig brain thing, you're interfering with the building blocks of life. It's immoral. It's sacrilegious. Bang on the table. Not his hand. The bottle? I don't believe I'm hearing this. Who have you been listening to? You're an educated person. You did this stuff yourself. It's just proteins. You know that. There's nothing sacred about cells and tissue. It's just, I'm familiar with the theory. <laughs> So, so the reason I wanted you to, to uh, where we picked that passage was, you know, as we discussed, um, the I don't, I don't just arbitrarily hand her <laughs> passages to read. <laughs> um, you're sitting, of course, in, in one of the meccas of biotech, um, literally in the middle of it, um, uh, perhaps the mecca in a few years. Um, and here you have encapsulated much of the debate about biotech and, and, and the fears. What should it be used for and what, for whom? Right. And sort of that's one of the central issues in your novel as well. Um, I guess one way of putting it is, uh, don't you feel ashamed of yourself? <laughs> Actually not. <laughs> I think these are, you know, these are things that people really, really have to think hard about because um, the Pandora's box has been opened. You know, it's the biggest toy box in the world, being able to create new life forms. And um, some of it, it's like anything else. Like anything else in science, it's a tool. But whether that tool is used for good purposes or bad purposes does not depend on the tool. It depends on the people using the tool. So these are the questions that people need to really think about. Um, is it going to be a big money-making enterprise? Is it going to be a situation in which nothing counts but um, the profits? Is it going to be a situation in which um, scientists will subvert what they know uh, or be silenced? Uh, or is it going to be a situation in which everything is quite open and, um, and people are, are, can feel free to say, this isn't a place where we should be going. You know, we should be doing this, we shouldn't be doing this. There is that wonderful book called Things Bite Back. It's about the doctrine of unintended consequences. And even without the ability to make new life forms, we've already created a lot of ecological messes just by introducing species into environments where they didn't used to be. Ask the New Zealanders about the Australian possum. Yes, they make nice socks. <laughs> but they're devastating New Zealand. And uh, there is that, it would be funny if it weren't so awful, thing that happened in Hawaii, 
where there were some um, bad snails they wanted to get rid of. So they brought in some, some other snails that they hoped would eat the bad snails, but instead the other snails ate the things that they were hoping to protect. So, so, um, so I would say more research is needed. Right. <laughs> Hear that? Always. More research is needed. <laughs> um, so, 